Now that we have some really basic hardware done, let's talk about actually implementing one of the opcodes from the Z machine. So what I've chosen is to implement the OR opcode. Why? Well, if we look at the table of opcodes, we can see that zero is an illegal opcode, so we're obviously not going to uh, work on that one. Um, the next bunch of opcodes are jumps to locations, uh, which I don't want to deal with at the moment. Um, but so the next uh, opcode, which seems fairly simple, is to simply OR two numbers together and store the result somewhere. So uh, this is a uh, spreadsheet that I have put together, which uh, basically um, maps out various bits of dedicated hardware and the commands that get sent to the hardware in order to implement the opcode. So in the beginning, we can see that we're just doing our fetch and execute cycle. Um, remember earlier I talked about a micro address counter. Um, and so the very first thing that we're going to have to do is have some sort of a bit of uh, memory hardware, which reads a byte from memory at the current instruction pointer. So we have an address that we pass into it. We, we give it a destination register. I'm just calling it M for now. M is an 8-bit register. And the operation that we're going to do is read. Um, we are also going to have an ALU. Uh, in this case, it is simply incrementing the instruction pointer because, of course, we've just read a byte. So you know when we go and read something next, it's going to be the next byte. Um, you'll notice that we have two ALUs, and I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, and then there's this VAR hardware, which I'll also get to shortly. So once we have read the uh, memory into the register, we need to increment the micro address and go to the next uh, location in the micro program. Now the next thing we're going to do is it's just some sort of operation that I'm calling op jump. Basically what it does is it looks at the value in M and it goes to some location in the microprogram based on M. So of course M can be any of 256 values. So basically we're, uh, we're doing an indirect jump table essentially. So um, we are going to jump to uh, this location, which is for opcode 8. Now remember that uh, for the two operand instructions, um, they have essentially five different uh, configurations. Um, there's 0, 8, 2, 8, 4, 8, and so on. Uh, this configuration that we're going to choose is just the one that takes two uh, small constants. So because they're two small constants, they fit in uh, eight bits in memory. So we're going to read one byte, increment the instruction pointer, read the next byte, increment the instruction pointer. But also, uh, we are going to compute using the 16-bit ALU, not the address ALU. We're going to compute the logical OR of OP0 and OP1, which is where we stored the two uh, operands. And we're going to put the result in OP0. So we can do all of this in parallel. Uh, so here's the thing where we got to um, two separate ALUs. Uh, one is specifically for addresses and one is specifically for 16-bit values. So remember that the Z machine is a 16-bit machine. However, also recall that it can address more than 16 bits of memory. So uh, typically you have maybe 128K. Um, so that's 17 bits, and rather than stuff all that functionality into a single ALU, I've decided to have two ALUs. One is just for computing addresses, and the other is for uh, more general computation on 16-bit numbers. So of course the address ALU is going to be 17 bits, or 18 bits if you happen to have 256K of memory, and so on. Um, because versions 
uh, one through three of the Z machine can only address up to 128K, this address ALU is going to be 17 bits, at least for these versions. Okay, so uh, we've read the two small constants into op zero and op one. The next thing that we're going to do is read where we're going to store the result. Uh, I have read it into an 8-bit register that I'm just calling V for var, um, because this is the storage variable. Now remember that uh, if the storage variable is uh, 0, that means that we're pushing the value onto the stack. If it's 1 through f, then it's a local uh, variable. And if it's 1, 0 through ff, then it's a global variable. So we will have to deal with that somehow. And that's what I've done here. Um, I have given the micro address a call capability. We do have a limited stack of return addresses, you know, maybe four, say. Um, so we can call into subroutines that will be common to our microprogram. In this case, uh, the subroutine is called store var, and basically what we're going to do is first, we're going to compare uh, v to zero. Now you'll notice that I'm doing that using the 16-bit ALU. Um, so in this case, we're just going to zero extend v because they're only eight bits. And we're doing a subtract. This is basically the same thing as a compare, um, except that we don't store the result anywhere, which is allowed. And what this is going to do is it's going to set a z flag. And the z flag will tell the micro, uh, the micro address counter whether or not to jump to an address or just to to continue on. So in this case, uh, we have a new instruction called JNZ, jump if not zero. So uh, if we're, so let's take the case where uh, V is actually zero. So we want to store this, uh, the result onto the stack. So in that case, we're going to jump to, uh, no, okay. In that case, we're going to increment the micro address uh, to call the push subroutine. The push subroutine simply writes the high byte of op zero into wherever the SP, the stack pointer is pointing, and we're going to use the address ALU to increment the stack pointer. And then we do it again for the low value, for the low byte in op zero. And then we return from our subroutine, and then we return from that subroutine, um, which goes back to jump to fetch, which starts the fetch execute cycle once again. Um, so similarly, um, if v is not zero, we would jump to store of our one, which is here. So here is where we um, exercise the var uh, hardware. The only thing that the var hardware do is it does is compute the address uh, that we want to access based on V and based on the frame pointer, which is where the locals are stored, or the global pointer, which is where the globals are stored. And the result is going to be put into an X register. I just called it X. Um, and that's an address type register. Uh, so once we do that, then we know that all we have to do is write uh, op zero high and op zero low to uh, wherever x is pointing to, incrementing x in the meantime, of course, and then we simply return and we jump back to our fetch execute cycle. So that's really how it works. Um, so this basically tells us that we need, uh, aside from the micro address uh, counter, we have four other bits of hardware. Uh, that we need to implement. Now, before we get to that, um, let me just make a brief correction to uh, the discussion about frames. So remember we have uh, local variables are stored on the stack in something called a frame. Now the problem is that earlier when I talked about the frame, I said, oh, we're, we just put the return address in the frame as well. Well, there's the problem. The problem is that if the stack is a 16-bit stack and addresses are 17 bits, well, we can't fit the return address onto the stack unless we use, say, three bytes per stack entry, but that gets a little wasteful. So instead, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have actually uh, 
two stacks. So we're going to have a user stack, which is 16 bits, and we're going to have an address stack, which is however many bits is however many bits wide is necessary to store a single address. Um, the user stack is going to be stored in RAM. The address stack is also going to be stored in RAM, but only on the FPGA. So you have RAM blocks inside the FPGA, which, which we can use. And we're just going to use that for some smaller address stack. So the address stack stores addresses. Um, the, uh, we, all, we have the frame pointer. Frame pointer is an address. We have the uh, return address, that's an address. Uh, we also have a pointer to the address stack, which isn't an address, but nevertheless, we are going to store that on the address stack anyway. Uh, the user stack is basically going to be reserved for the locals and whatever you push, whatever values you push onto the stack. So there's a procedure that you use for popping a frame and there's a procedure that you use for pushing a frame. But basically the idea is that you can maintain these two stacks in parallel. So that's the microprogram. So let's get to implementing something simple. Um, let us start with where are we going to store all of these registers? So let's start with the micro address counter. Now, um, I've enhanced our original micro address counter. Uh, let's look at the, um, the micro address types package first. Um, I've named it micro address types in order to differentiate it from the actual micro address counter um, and to basically be very explicit that this package is for types only. Uh, the other thing is that it's best practice to put underscore t after the name of a type. Uh, this is true not only here, but also in C and C++. You should always do that so that you're sure, uh, so that you know that you're dealing with a type. So uh, what I've done is I've expanded the number of commands that the micro address counter can take. Um, you can see that I've renamed uh, load to jump. Um, so we have jump if not zero, we have call, return, and the op jump uh, command. And I've also uh, placed a special type def to indicate how wide our addresses are. So here I'm saying that our addresses uh, can go from zero to 2k minus one. Or we have 2k addresses. So this is useful because we can now use it everywhere. Uh, instead of having to explicitly state everywhere bit 10 down to zero. So here is the micro address counter module itself. You'll notice that I'm importing um, the micro address type from the micro address types package so that I can simply refer to that type as micro address T as opposed to this where I didn't bother doing an import for the command type. Um, number one, I'm only using it once right over here. Uh, and number two, all of the other modules are also going to have commands. So I'm just going to specify it right here. So uh, differences from the previous micro address counter, you can see that we're including a Z flag. This is necessary for the jump if not zero command. I have also included uh, an M, which is um, 8 bits, and that has to be used for the op jump. Now also you might notice that I've changed uh, all of the, the input and output types, well I've changed uh, pretty much everything, to uh, instead of logic I'm now using bit and byte. Um, bit and byte are different from logic vectors in that logic has four states. There's ordinary zero and one, there's high impedance, which is Z, and there's don't care, which is X. Now, in this case, there's nowhere that I'm really going to use high impedance states, except maybe for one or two special cases uh, when we're dealing with external hardware. Uh, and also, we're never going to have don't cares, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so instead, I'm using the two-valued um, types. Uh, so bit is the two-valued type that corresponds to logic. Byte is also two-valued and consists of eight bits. Also, byte by default is considered as signed uh, when you're doing operations with it. So I'm explicitly saying that this is an unsigned byte. 
Now, in the micro address counter, I never actually use the signedness of, of M, but nevertheless, it's good to be pretty explicit about that. Uh, the rest is pretty much the same. Here, I specified a parameter. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, now, I've also specified an array, and this uh, notation over here is known as an unpacked uh, size. So this is a packed size, which basically means that this is a number of bits. This is an unpacked size, which is not a number of bits. In other words, it's not four bits, in other words, 16, but it is actually just four elements. So what I've done is I've basically specified a, a call stack of uh, micro addresses, and the, the depth of the call stack is four. Now, that's internal. I'm not uh, leaking it out of the module because it's strictly internal. And also, uh, because this is essentially a state machine, I have a corresponding uh, next call stack. Uh, same thing with the call stack pointer. And of course, I have to specify the, uh, the number of bits properly. Um, and the next call stack pointer. Now, the next thing that I have is the op jump table, which we talked about. And of course, it's going to be 256 uh, micro addresses. And I'm using this construct here, which is actually synthesizable um, by Vivado. It's an initial block. And you can put a begin and an end around here, but since it's one statement, I don't do that. Um, readmemh is a function that is defined in system Verilog. It means uh, read a file that is formatted in hexadecimal, um, and it looks like this. So this is my uh, test op jump table. Uh, you can see that I'm specifying 000 for uh, the first element. Uh, 1AB for the second element, and so on, all the way down to the full 256 elements. Now, of course, this is element 0, this is element 1, and so on. It's just that these are the line numbers uh, in Sublime text. So um, I am specifying the file name as this variable, which is a parameter. So this is an example of using a module parameter, which you declare like this. Um, I'm, you know, the default value is just going to be empty. Um, obviously, that would never work. Um, but when we instantiate the micro address counter, we get to specify uh, what the op jump table file is. Um, and the second parameter is basically uh, where you want to put the resulting data. So it's obviously going to be an op jump table. Okay, and then the next thing is basically just, you know, more of the same. Um, so I'm saying that uh, by default, the next call stack pointer is the current call stack pointer, and the next call stack, all of the values in the next call stack, is equal to the current value of the call stack. And then if we jump, we set the address to the load address. Jump if not zero, we check the Z flag, and we load the load address if the Z flag is zero. Um, otherwise, we just go to the next address. With call, what we do is we push the next address onto the stack. And then the next address is where you want to go to. And return is pretty much the opposite. Um, op jump is simply um, index into the op jump table, uh, whatever M is, and that's your next address. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Uh, for reset, I have, of course, set the call stack pointer to zero. Um, and then uh, during the uh, clock phase, uh, on the next clock edge, we set the address, the call stack pointer, and the call stack to whatever it is we wanted to set up. And that's all there is to it. Um, let's see. So let's take a look at the test program. Uh, the test program has been extended somewhat. So obviously for the test case, we now want to specify the Z flag and the M uh, value. I'm also using uh, this C++ construct so that I don't have to keep typing uh, micro address counter, micro address types, colon, colon, command type all the time. So now I'm basically aliasing that to command type. Um, I've modified the test cases. So basically I'm testing uh, increment, reset. Um, I'm testing jump. I'm testing another jump. This, this test right here is uh, to make sure that I only have as many bits as I think I should have. Um, so even though in C, the type of micro address is uh, 16 bits, 
um, in in uh, my Verilog source, of course, it's only 11 bits. So I just want to make sure that only those 11 bits got set, um, that I didn't make any mistake in terms of the size of the uh, address. Uh, then I do a reset, I test call, I test return, I test two calls. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm testing um, a call inside another call, making sure that works. I'm testing jump if not zero to make sure that works, both with Z1 and Z0. And then finally, I'm testing uh, op jump. I'm testing it with m equals one, two, and three. And you can see from the table test, m equals one would go to one AB, m equals two goes to zero, one, two, and m equals three goes to zero. You know, if I've, uh, if I can do those jumps, then it's pretty much assured that I can do all the jumps uh, and that the, uh, and that the hardware is working. Okay, so uh, the structure of the test. So the main looks very much similar. Um, I'm just initializing all the values, um, setting up the test cases. Um, here, before I do the first eval, I, I set all the counter inputs to the test case. Um, I strobe the clock, doing an evaluation on each change. And then I call this function, uh, which is just going to test one aspect um, of the result. Now, in this case, I'm only testing one aspect. I'm testing one output. I'm making sure that the expected output, uh, that the test, that the module's output is equal to the expected output. But in other modules, we may have several outputs, and I want to be able to print a nice message for any failures on any of the outputs. So I've extracted this function over here um, to basically print out you know, if anything goes wrong. Um, and finally, what I've done is I've counted up the number of passes and basically printed how many tests passed out of how many tests. Uh, because once you see uh, all of the tests scro scroll off the, s the screen, it would be nice to have a summary at the end. So finally, what I've done is I've created a make file um, because it's kind of a pain to have to run the Verilator commit to type the Verilator command in every single time. So I've used some GNU make file magic here to uh, basically allow you to say simply make micro address counter. Um, and it's up to date now, of course, I'm going to uh, say touch one of these guys and make micro address counter and it basically runs the entire thing um, all the way down to giving you an executable. And now I can run the executable by saying micro address counter, micro address counter. And hey, 22 out of 22 tests passed. That's good enough for me. So um, I may have to change the make file a little bit because right now the uh, make file is generic for any module. Um, and also, uh, an important thing to realize is that for every module, you have to run a separate uh, Verilator pass because Verilator only lets you specify one top module and all the other sub-modules are basically hidden. So you're only allowed to do effectively end-to-end -end tests. In order to do unit tests, you will have to um, Verilate, uh, run through Verilator uh, one top module at a time. So that's why for every module you have to um, you have to specify every single module, um, and then you can do a make all, which will um, make all of the modules and all the tests for all of the modules. And you specify which modules you have up here on the first line. Uh, you also have to specify the type files in the right order so that Verilator knows uh, what is being used when. So anyway, what I was saying is that I may have to change this make file a little, a little bit because right now um, I'm using this one Verilator flag, the minus G flag, which lets you set parameters for modules. Apparently there is no way in the C code to set a parameter because uh, Verilator actually compiles the module with all its parameters. So you could do it this way or maybe you could specify, you know, if you wanted to have two modules with two different parameters and test that that worked, you could have a top level module which instantiates the two modules with those parameters being set to different values. And then you would access one module and test it, and then you would access the second module and test it. 
um, or I should say the second instance of the module and test it. So um, um, anyway, I'm just going to stick with that and see if it works with uh, everything else. So that's the micro address counter. Let's talk about now uh, the registers. For registers, I've set up a module and I have placed some registers that we're going to need. Here are the M and the V registers, which are bytes. There are eight bits. Here are the op0 and op1 registers. Those are 16 bits. Uh, short int is the way you say 16 bits um, for two-valued logic. Um, that is uh, a logic that doesn't have X and Z states. And then we have uh, the X register and we have the various pointer registers, the stack pointer, frame pointer, global variable pointer, instruction pointer, and address stack pointer. And those are all address types. Now, how do we, um, how do we write to the registers? Well, reading from the registers, of course, uh, this module outputs the registers at all times. So we can read from the registers whenever we want. But writing to the registers, we have to specify which register we want to write to and what is the value of the register to write. So you can see that I have these other four sections. These correspond to our little bits of dedicated hardware. So we have memory hardware, we have the ALU, we have the address ALU, and we also have the variable uh, hardware. Each one of them can select one of the registers to write to, and it can specify the data to write. So we have, for example, memory destination select, and this is of type name type. And if you look at the register types, I have specified all the different registers that we can write to. There are a few extra ones here, which I have put in because sometimes we want to write an 8-bit value to a 16-bit register. And sometimes we want to write to the low uh, 8 bits, and sometimes we want to write to the high 8 bits. So I've done that for the OP0 and OP1 registers. And those are the destinations that we can write to. So we have the memory destination select and the memory data, the ALU destination select and the ALU data, and so on. Now, because the memory uh, hardware can only output eight bits, that would be the mem data. It's only a byte. Same thing with the ALU, it's 16 bits, so we write a short int. Um, and the address ALU and the variable hardware both output uh, address types. So here's our usual um, state machine thing where we, where we have um, next variables. And we have a combinatorial section up here. And down here we have the um, sequential section where on the positive edge of the clock we write the next value of the register. So the question becomes, well, what happens if two bits of hardware want to write the same register at the same time? Well, we use a kind of priority. Um, so for M and for V, we actually don't allow any of the um, dedicated hardware to write to it except for the memory hardware. However, for OP0 and OP1, either the memory section can write to it, or the ALU section can write to it. So what we do is we say, well, if the memory hardware and the ALU hardware want to write to the OP0 register at the same time, we'll choose the memory um, output first. Uh, in practice, you would write your microprogram so that that never happens. Um, so we really didn't have to worry about that, but nevertheless, we did have to pick um, some sort of ordering. So, um, so what this means, uh, this is a, a kind of a complicated statement. So basically, if we want to write to op zero high, then 
uh, the next op0 high, that is the high 8 bits in the op0 register, will get uh, the memory data. Otherwise, if we want to write register op0, then we're going to set the high 8 bits of op0 to 0. Because effectively what we're doing is we're saying, okay, I've got 8 bits in, in memory, and I want to write it to op0, but I want to 0 extend it. So that's the difference really between op0 high and op0. Um, so for the ALU, um, of course, if we want to write op0, then of course we want to write the high 8 bits of the 16-bit ALU to the high 8 bits of op0. And if none of those are selected, then we simply keep the current value. Um, and the same thing with op0 low, op0, uh, op1 high, op1 low. Um, there's x. Um, for x, this is actually kind of a silly way of indenting this. There we go. That looks a little more regular. Oh, performance issues. Who cares? Um, so here, um, we can write the X register using either the address ALU or the VAR hardware. So that's what this does. Um, and then uh, for the other pointers, we only use the address ALU. Now, that could change in the future. You know, maybe, maybe we decide that suddenly uh, we want to write the stack pointer with uh, something from the VAR hardware. I don't know. Or maybe we have some other bit of hardware that we want to add. In which case, we'll just simply change the logic. So. So that's how the register file works. Um, this is the register uh, type. Um, you can see that we've defined an address type, which is 17 bits. So that corresponds to our address ALU and our VAR hardware. So let's take a look at the test. It's fairly straightforward, even though it looks quite large. Um, this is pretty much the same template as we used before. Um, I'm shortening the name of the name type. Um, I have a test case which has a name, and we specify the inputs, which are the uh, destination selects and the data, and the expected outputs, which are all of the registers. Um, again, uh, you'll note that M and V are 8 bits, OP0 and OP1 are 16 bits. Um, X through AP are 17 bits, but of course we don't have a 17-bit type, so we're simply using the next highest size, which is 32 bits. And the test cases. So I've just named the test case, um, you know, the hardware to whatever register. And then I'm setting up the values. And you notice that we have a none, which basically means uh, do not write to any register. Um, and we simply write each register, and we're collecting the values. Um, here's from the address ALU, and we're collecting more values. Here's the ALU, and here's the VAR. Um, and remember that I said that we wanted to sort of divide each test um, into testing just one element or one expected value. This is so that we can write out um, what we expected and what it actually was in a little nicer way. So for example, for the M register, obviously we've only got two hex digits. Um, for the op0 register, we've only got four and so on. Um, and uh, basically we simply set up the data. Um, for every test case, we set up the data, run eval, strobe the clock, and then we check the expected value. Um, and this is, uh, this is um, the, the nice way that we can simply determine whether the entire test has passed or not, and then we collect it up. So um, if we look at the make file, I have made uh, a slight change here. Uh, what I've done is I have set up an extra flags variable, um, and I have appended the name of the module. So if we have an ex if we have uh, a module that doesn't require uh, these parameters to be set, then we simply do not set extra flags for it, and that's what this um, special incantation does. So let's go ahead and make. Here, let me remove the old one. Register file. Make register file. It goes ahead and makes it. Great register file, 
and run the executable and we have 18 out of 18 tests passed. Great, so that worked. So I think that uh, for the next video, I'm going to go on to the next uh, bits of hardware, which are the ALU, the address ALU, and the VAR hardware. And after that, we get to something a little more complicated, which is storing the actual microprogram.